Well, hello, everybody. I'm really excited to have you here with us today for our very first Tours on Tap. Um, for those who may not know me, my name is David Moore, and I'm DRA's uh, Placemaking and Activations Manager. Today, we're going to have a short tour followed by a tasting um, led by John Oldendorf of uh, Clouds Brewing. Um, we're really, again, excited to have you here today and to be featuring one of our uh, downtown craft breweries. Um, so again, we're going to start with a short uh, video uh, that highlights Cloud's uh, brewing facility and also walks you through the uh, brewing process that they do. So give me one moment to pull that up and we'll get started. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that short video of Clouds and their facility and learning about their brewing uh, process. Um, although we do have you guys muted, um, we wanna hear from you. So anytime during the tasting, please ask questions in the chat. Um, and as John goes through each beer, um, I'll be sure to ask him those questions right after he finishes up uh, the description. Again, we have six beers today that we're gonna go through. We'll spend about five minutes on each. And at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to John. All right, hello, I'm John Olendorf. I'm the uh, brewer and one of the owners of Clouds Brewing. Uh, I moved out to Raleigh, what, about five years ago, five and a half years ago to start the brewery with a friend of mine. Um, so we're gonna go through six beers that I think kind of represent a range of beers that we make at Clouds. Uh, so I kind of have an order in mind here. So the first one I'm gonna start with is the El Jefe. Uh, get myself a glass. So the El Jefe is a Bavarian wheat. 
So it's a, a pretty popular style of beer in Germany, uh, wheat beers. Uh, typically, it's a, a cloudy beer, but as it sits in the bottle for a while, you can see it kind of clears up a bit. Um, the good option is to stir up the glass, the bottle before you pour it, uh, to get a lot more of that yeast in suspension. Uh, it doesn't affect the flavor, it's just more of a visual effect. Uh, so the um, most beers are broken down into three primary yeast categories. There's wheat yeast, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, wheat yeast, uh, ale yeast, and lager yeast. So this is an example of a wheat yeast. So go ahead and start by smelling the beer, so you get a little bit of the aromas. Uh, this beer is, style beer is known for having wheat, oh, sorry, <laughs> I keep mixing up, having banana and clove uh, aromas. About 50% of the grain bill on this beer is wheat, malted wheat. Uh, the rest is uh, your standard barley uh, malts. So again, you should be picking up a little bit of that banana flavor, a lot of the clove flavor in this version. This is actually one of our better selling beers. Uh, there's not a whole lot of wheat beers in the market. Um, and what are mostly our American wheats, are, which don't have nearly as much flavor as the German wheats have. I don't know if there's any, um, hoping to make this interactive. So if anybody has any questions about the beer or the style, uh, please let me know. We can start talking to that. I have a question, John. Sure, go ahead, David. Uh, can you remind us how long it takes to brew a beer? Sure. Uh, so it ranges, If you, uh, the video went through kind of quickly there, but uh, depending upon the style of beer, it's anywhere from two to you know, six weeks for our beers. Uh, so the wheat beer is one of our faster ones. Uh, so the, because this beer is intentionally cloudy, it allows us to rush it through a little quicker and not wait for the beer to clarify in the fermenter. Uh, so it takes about a week for primary fermentation to get most of the yeast uh, consuming the sugars. And then after that, it's just the beer is settling out and clarifying and uh, just the flavors are kind of balancing out. So this is a pretty quick beer. This is usually about two weeks from brew day to the time it's in the kegs. And also in the background here, kind of see our brewery. A little quick tour. Oops. We have a question, John. Yes. So someone asked, what makes uh, the El Jefe beer cloudy? So it, it, again, it's, it's because of the type of yeast that's used. Um, different yeast will, uh, uh, when the yeast is done consuming the sugars, it's uh, the, the year, they call it flocculation. So the yeast will kind of drop out of suspension into the bottom of the tank. And certain yeast are more prone to dropping than other yeast are. So the wheat yeast stay in suspension a little bit more than other wheat, other uh, yeast do. Uh, sometimes you want a clear beer, so you use yeast that you know is gonna flocculate really well, to clarify the beer better. Uh, the other part of it is that the beer uses a lot of wheat. Uh, and wheat just as, a, as an adjunct just creates a lot more haze in a beer. So between the wheat and the, uh, and the yeast, and the other third part of the fact that we brew this beer pretty quickly, it doesn't give time for a lot of things to drop out of suspension. So the beer stays cloudy for that reason too. Thanks. Um, and then we have another question. Um, and this actually is not necessarily related to the El Jefe beer, but do you remember what the first beer was that you guys brewed? And is that still in production today? Um, actually, so we, uh, we got our permit just in time. We had about two weeks to go before St. Patrick's Day weekend. So we wanted to brew something fast. We also want something related to St. Patrick's Day. So the first beer we actually shipped was an Irish stout. And, and we do not make that beer anymore. It was just a one-time thing just for St. Patrick's Day. Um, but the next beer we're about to taste at the Volkenbrau was a, probably our second beer we brewed. It's a lager. But being awesome. a lager, it just takes longer. It wasn't ready to be done in time for St. Patrick's Day weekend. Cool. Love that story. Um, another question we received from the crowd is, uh, what's a good meal to pair with this type of beer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the cheating answer is you think about where the beer originates from. So this is a German style beer. You kind of think about German foods. So like, like a, a roast pork or um, obviously a Bavarian pretzel. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy beer for the low, low alcohol level. So it, it Holds up really well to like more robust flavors and food. Cool, thanks for that. You can go ahead and continue on. All right, so our next beer is our Vulcanbrau. So when we originally started the brewery, 
our working title for the brewery was Storm Clouds Brewing. So when my partner used to hang out after work, we'd uh, talk about opening a brewery someday. And that was the name that we came up with 20 some years ago. Uh, so we started advertising Storm Clouds Brewing and we got a cease and desist letter from a brewery called Storm Cloud Brewing in Michigan. So uh, we quickly became Clouds Brewing. And so what we did was we Googled Clouds Brewing uh, in German translation and it came out to be Volkenbrau. So Volkenbrau just sounded like a really cool name for a German style lager. So it's our, it's our namesake beer. It's also the first lager we brewed. So you can see this beer is a very clear beer. This is something, I mean, you hate to call a craft beer or a Budweiser or a PBR, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an American lager. Uh, we brew it with all German ingredients. It's all German malts, all German hops, German yeast. Uh, but we do add corn and rice, which is pretty typical of American style lagers. So it's a very light, very refreshing beer. This was one of the first beers we entered into competition. So this beer got a gold medal our first year in the, uh, uh, which one was that called? It was the, uh, uh, the Carolina, uh, why am I dropping it? The North Carolina Brewers Cup. So we've been brewing this beer for, how has it been now? So, I uh, can't do math in my head anymore. So about four years now. So this is, we were one of the, not a lot of brewers are making these light lagers back then, but it's pretty common now to see a lot of breweries making their light lagers. We got a couple of questions from the crowd. Uh, Certainly. First, um, someone commented on this beer having a great aftertaste. What causes that? Again, it's just a really clean lager. So uh, this beer takes about six weeks to brew. So the, uh, the lager yeast, uh, some things typical, about, unique about lager yeast versus a wheat yeast or a ale yeast, a lager yeast work at a cooler temperature. So the beer is fermented colder. Um, so our other two beers, styles of yeast, we usually do 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This beer ferments at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so what happens is that the beer, the yeast works slower and it works more efficiently. It actually eats uh, sugars that the other yeast can't eat because they're too complex for those other yeast to eat them. So a lager will actually eat more sugar. It'll create a, a lot less aftertaste. It's a much cleaner style of beer. Um, and so just there's a lot fewer byproducts from the fermentation process. The faster the yeast works, the more byproducts you get from the yeast uh, consumption process. So like a, um, like a Belgian beer that could be brewed at a really high temperature, and you get all kinds of funky aromas and flavors from those beers, which some of us love, but it's not a lager. So this, this is a really clean beer. Uh, also, because it has the rice and the, the corn, those are very fermentable sugars. So a malted barley, when you, when you malt the malted, malted barley, uh, you end up with a bunch of different types of sugars. You get fructose, glucose, maltose, a wide range of sugars. There are different complexities of sugars. Uh, whereas corn sugar from the corn and rice sugar from the rice are very simple sugars. So the, the yeast eats those completely and leaves very little aftertaste. So by adding those um, adjuncts to the grain bill, you get the alcohol, but you don't get a lot of byproducts. And so you just get a much cleaner beer. And given this, you know, this the five weeks in the tank to just the mellow and lager, it just gives you a really clean, refreshing beer. Thanks for that great info. Um, one more question before we move on. And this is kind of just like a high level question. What is a good beer to start with if you're not well versed in craft beers? Oof, Specifically you yours. Yeah. Um, well, most of the time we, we ask people what they like to drink. Most people drink beer already. So if people come in and say they, they only drink, you know, the Millers and those kind of beers, the Smoking Brothers is the one we first introduced them to. It's, it's a really easy way to get into beer drinking um, you know, because beer can get crazy. You can get all different colors of beer. You can get different uh, hop levels. You can get different fruit additions. And so this is a nice, easy way to say, oh, yeah, this tastes like beer is what I'm used to. Um, but actually, the, the next beer we're about to taste the accumulation is probably the one I usually recommend to people who are a little bit more adventurous. It's another lager, it's an amber lager, so it's got a little bit more malt flavor to it, um, but it's still a really clean, refreshing beer and it's, 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 it does really well in the market. Awesome, thanks for that, you can right. keep going on. So anything else on the Volkenbrau? All right, so we were gonna go to the third beer now, 
This is the accumulation. So this beer was originally brewed as our Oktoberfest. So it's a, a Martin style beer. So it's, it's amber color, uh, malt forward. Uh, what we found out afterwards is we started trying to sell it in the market is people don't really know what a Martin is. And when you tell them it's an Oktoberfest style beer, they don't want to drink it except for September and October. So we uh, rebranded it as an amber lager. Uh, again, so it's another, another lager, another beer that takes, you know, five to six weeks to brew. Um, we need a lager. It also has very little um, aromas than other byproducts from the brewing process. You can kind of smell the malt, the, uh, the more caramel kind of flavors you get from the darker malts. So I usually tell people this beer is similar to Red Oak, but not quite as sweet as a Red Oak beer. So it's much cleaner beer. It's also kind of similar to like a Dos Equis, uh, Amber. So we got a question from the crowd. Absolutely. Um, what inspires the flavors that you all come up with? Like you just said, beers can go crazy and can uh, come in all types and of different flavors. So just real quick, could you tell us a little bit more on what inspires Klaus Brewing to make the type of beers that they do? Sure. So uh, I actually studied brewing in Germany. I did a program that took part, it was done in Chicago for part of the program. And then part of the program was in uh, Munich. And so uh, it was kind of like a little beer nerd fantasy camp for me. You know, they go out and do that for a while. Um, but I'm just a big fan of German style beers. So about half of our beers are influenced by the German styles. These first three that we had are all German styles. Um, Beyond that, we have the restaurants. And so our restaurants have a lot of taps. And so we have a lot of room for variety. Uh, so, so after we got the German stuff going, the question was, well, what else do we need to fill out our lineup? And so obviously things like IPAs came up and stouts. And so that's where those beers came into play. Um, but we're also influenced. I've got, you know, I've got outside salespeople going to on accounts, trying to sell our beer. Uh, we've got a lot of friends uh, who join our sensory panels. And we're constantly looking for what's interesting and new and what can we do differently. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, another kind of random question while we were on the subject of being a beer nerd and going to Germany. Um, have you ever been to Oktoberfest there? Yes, I have. Yeah, which they, uh, they canceled this year. Yeah, that's understandable. But what, can you yeah. just quickly just what's the experience like at Oktoberfest? Oh, I try to try this one. So think of like the biggest circus tent you've ever been in. Just a massive tent, maybe 100 feet wide by 500 feet long. It's full of people standing shoulder to shoulder, drinking the big leader steins of beer. Um, everybody around you speaking different languages because it draws people from all over the world. When I was there, I was on a tour group with a bunch of uh, Americans and Australians, so we're all speaking English. But we have Germans on our left, we have Italians on our right, um, and within an hour, you're talking to everybody, even if you can't understand them. Everybody's just drinking together, having a great, great time. So you sit there for five, six hours, drinking nonstop. You walk outside, and there's six more tents the same size outside that tent. And it's just, it's just massive. It's an incredible size of an event. Sounds like a good time. Uh, yeah. I just want to say to the crowd, remember, you know, keep throwing questions in the Q and A if you have any. Um, but John, I'm gonna let you continue on. Sure. All right. Um, that was the amber. I don't know how well we're pacing or not, but uh, so the next beer we're going to do is um, going to be our blood orange hop jam. So I get a bottle real quick. I'll be right back. My help is like flashing off on me. All right. So when I started the brewery, I mean, I enjoy IPAs, but I figure everybody's got IPAs and everybody makes IPAs and the world didn't need another IPA. Well, it turns out you have to have an IPA, so especially if you have a restaurant. So at our restaurant, we have, uh, both restaurants have what we call our, our downpour wells. It's a, uh, a system where you can pour your own beer. You get an electronic bracelet you can scan it turns the tap on, you can pour as much as you want, and it charges by the ounce. So we did an event there a couple years ago. Uh, I made 10 different IPAs. Each one, the same base malts, but each one had a different hop. So 
We had 10 different hops lined up side by side. So you can do an experiment and see which hop styles you like best. So what we ended up with, you know, I spent a couple hours there, tried all 10 beers, then started mixing them together, tried these two together, these two together. Uh, by the end of the night, I found three beer, three hops that I liked working well together. It was uh, hops called the Drillo, Amarillo, and Mosaic. And so it also made a pretty cool acronym. So we made a beer called Hop Jam. So the, the jam is the acronym for Drillo, Amarillo, Mosaic. So we were making our Hop Jam for a while there, and it's one of our best selling beers because it's our only IPA. Uh, and then my sales rep came back from vacation from Denver, and he told me every brewery in Denver is making a blood orange IPA. So we tried adding some blood orange to ours, and this is what we ended up with. So we have both our regular hop jam and our blood orange version of the hop jam. So these beers are really fruity. Uh, it's a combination of the blood orange and also the hops that are used. They're just really fruity hops. A lot of uh, citrus flavors. Speaking of hops, where do you guys source yours from? Where's, I'm sorry, question? Where do you source your hops from? Um, it depends. So for the, um, the German style beers, I like to have authentic German hops. So they're all Hallertau for the most part, which are grown in the Hallertau region of Germany. Um, but for the um, for IPAs, IPAs, you know, even though they, you know, England gets credit for creating the IPA, America has taken ownership of the IPA. So most IPAs are heavily hopped with American hops. So all of these hops are made like mostly on the West Coast. Thank you for that. Um, I actually have a question um, sure. because I, again, I, I don't have very much experience with uh, craft uh, beer, but I'm curious to know when it comes to drinking them in the certain glasses, uh, what difference does that make with using the certain different kinds of glasses that one can find at a brewery or even purchase for their home? Yeah, so the, the, the main thing, it's kind of like wine where the, uh, the bigger the opening of the glass, the more you get the aromas of the beer. Your nose is actually in the glass when you're drinking it. And so a lot of like Belgian beers get served in the big goblets. So you actually get all those aromas from the beer. Um, it's not as critical for shake a lager where you're not really trying to get the aromas. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's really more tradition than anything else. People have just gotten used to having that glass for that style of beer. Um, other, other than the aroma factor, uh, they like to have the tall, thin Pilsner glasses for a Pilsner beer so they can watch the bubbles rise from the bottom of the glass. Um, it's, it's just fun. Um, I've been to Belgium a couple of times and you go to a beer bar in Belgium, every brewery, that they carry has their own unique glass for their beer. So you have to have your Chimay glass, your Chimay beer, or Orval glass, or Orval beer. And it's just watching these bartenders have to go back through these 80 different glasses to find the right glass for the bottle you just ordered. It's pretty fun. So when talking about the different glasses, you mentioned like you can smell it. And so that, you know, gives you a certain sensation, but does the glass affect the taste at all? No, it wouldn't affect the taste at all. Just, it's a, just risk the aroma. Okay, awesome. Let the your glasses dirty. <laughs> we recommend cleaning your glasses first, folks. Yeah. Yeah, so here at the brewery, I use, uh, well, right now we're using plastic cups. Um, but for our German beers, we usually pour those in the half liter steins. Uh, we use our standard pint glasses for the IPAs. So we mix it up a little bit that way. Awesome. All right. But again, so this IPA, you can... We only had six beers, so I couldn't give you both the Hop Jam and the Blood Orange Hop Jam to try side by side. But the Hop Jam is, is a really fruity beer to start with. And then when you add this Blood Orange to it, it just really makes the fruit pop out of there. So it's, it's, it's a really, really nice beer. Um, Matt's bringing me some cool glass for a show off. Yeah. So there's the, the camera's backwards, so it throws me off. So yeah, so we'll use like the German Stein for the German beers and the, the Shaker Pint for the IPAs. All right. Famous plug real quick, but are those uh, glasses available for purchase? Of course. Awesome. Good yeah. to know. And they also just brought me a, a chalice. So this, we do our, um, the one Belgian beer that we make frequently is our Clouds 9, the 9% Belgian Golden. So that gets, of course, served on the chalice. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's open another cup. All right. So... Um, out of all the beers I brought, I set up for the six pack tonight, five are core beers that we have all the time. And, but I had one of our one-off beers. This one we just 
packaged uh, like a couple weeks ago. So this is our, calling it our Caribbean Kulch. It's really a, a grapefruit flavor. Uh, we add grapefruit puree to our basic Kulch. And I did some research, found out that grapefruits originate in Barbados, and we like the alliteration of Caribbean Kulch. So there you go, we have a Caribbean Kulch. So our standard Kulch is much clearer than this. This beer has a lot of uh, grapefruit pure, puree in there. So it, it makes the beer much more cloudy. You can smell the grapefruit. A Kolsch is a, um, a beer from a town in Germany called Cologne. And the Kolsch style beer is a really light, um, I, similar to like an American Blonde Ale. So it's a really light, easy to make ale. Um, that has, doesn't have a whole lot of flavor to it. So adding the, the grapefruit comes through really clear on this beer. So it's, it's a nice beer for breakfast. So we got a question from the crowd. Sure. Um, I think some of us have all experienced this, um, but you know, when you randomly have a gathering, uh, sometimes leftover beer gets left at your place. How long should you, how long is the shelf life on most beers uh, before it's just not, you should not drink it? it? It all depends how well it's kept. I mean, if you keep it in the fridge, obviously it's gonna have a longer shelf life than if you leave it out in the garage where it's gonna get warm. Um, if it's packaged well, most beers are gonna be good for, I would say, you know, two to three months. Um, some beers are actually, uh, people will age beers. They'll put them in a cellar, like wine, they'll age them for years and try them out that way. I went to uh, Belgium one time and we um, got a couple bottles of uh, Chimay Grand Reserve. I did think it's around 9.5% beer. It's a pretty big beer. Uh, mm -hmm. But we got three different years. We had that year's, and we had a five-year-old one, and we had a 20-year-old one, all side by side. And they were all still really good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But it's, it all depends on, so hops are preservative, alcohol is preservative. So between those two things, the more you got to those two items, the longer the beer is going to last. But awesome. Thank you for mentioning that. Most craft beers, I would recommend drinking it within a couple months of, of the being packaged. Okay. Not too long. Uh, like a beer, like a Budweiser, those things are pasteurized. So they've got a huge shelf life. They've been around good for years. Gotcha. Uh, quick question while we're still on the Kolsch. Uh, what... Well, actually, let me take it back a step back. Uh, what is what is a top seller of uh, the beers that you all produce? It's one of your so best sellers. Our hop jam is our highest seller because um, it's our only year-round IPA before we added the hop the blood orange. Um, and beyond that, I would say probably it, it, it comes down to the El Jefe and our precipitation and our Vulcan Brow. Those are all sell pretty well. So they're all lower alcohol beers. They go really well with food. So they're, they're good things to have at restaurants. A lot of our customers are restaurants. Um, it's hard to sell really big flavorful beers at a restaurant because they clash with the food. So these, these more of these mild beers that we make with really well. But the one-off beers sell really well too. So we do a, um, we're constantly, we have a kettle sour beer we make. We call mm -hmm. it our Mean Girl. And so it's a, um, it's a complex beer to make. If you actually have to do it in multiple days, you got to, make the sugar wort, the sugar water, the wort. Then you gotta put it in the kettle and you boil it really quick just to kill any uh, bacteria. Then you gotta cool it down to a temperature below 100 degrees. And then you pitch something called lactobacillus. And the lactobacillus will eat the sugar and create an acid byproduct. So the pH of the beer drops down in the kettle that way. Um, and then once the pH gets to our target level, then we gotta boil it again to kill the lactobacillus because we don't want that to stay in the beer. And then we finish brewing normally. We get it back heated up, add our hops, and then pitch it with normal yeast and let it ferment that way. Um, so it becomes a, a, a sour beer, a kettle sour beer. And then we mix that every year. Every time we make a batch, we use a different fruit on it. Our current version has uh, Nirangela fruit. And mm -hmm. so it's, uh, awesome. So yeah, uh, it was uh, always, sorry. So I just trying to remember why I started down that path. But yeah, okay. those are pretty good sellers. Uh, last question about the Kohl's. What's a great food pairing to go with this? Um, the, the, the standard Kolsch, again, it's just so light, it goes with anything. This grapefruit one, I don't know. To me, fruited beers, uh, do, it's just my bias. I like fruited beers with desserts. So I, I would have it go with something like a dessert or even a, a salad, something light, lighter like that. Um, they're pretty, 
subtle levels of fruit level on these uh, compared to like a big dark stout or something. But no, I've actually never had a meal with the Caribbean culture. I'll get one to try. Awesome. We had one last question just come through and I thought it's kind of funny. Um, someone from the crowd asked, has he really had this beer for breakfast before? <laughs> um, so when you work in a brewery, you, you can't control what time the beer needs to be drank. Uh, sometimes you have to do quality control as soon as you walk in the door, if you're chugging a batch of beer, but no, not, not a whole bottle for breakfast. <laughs> Good to know. I mean, you figure if you get there at eight or 9 AM and you're a brewer, it's going to happen. So, but it sounds like a cool perk of the job. Yeah. No, any, any time we're, we're testing beer, you're tasting is a huge part of testing beer. I mean, you're, you're measuring gravities, you're looking at colors, you're looking at clarity. But the most important thing about beer is taste. So every time you're doing an evaluation of beer, you're taking a sip of it. Awesome. Well, yeah, you can keep going on with the tasting. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we are now on the last of the six beers. This one is our Midnight Delights. Um, I'm trying to remember where the inspiration for this beer came from, other than we wanted to have a... Uh, I'm a big fan of chocolate. We want to have a dark beer. So we did a, um, an event, um, it was called Love is Bald. It was a kind of a, a charity fundraiser uh, slash competition. So we wanted to make a beer that was unique for that. So the first time we made this beer was for that event. It's a, um, what's called either a milk stout or a sweet stout. So the different styles of stouts, you know, there's dry Irish stout, there's imperial stouts, there's, um, I think it's something called Jamaican stout, but this is what they call a sweet stout. So one of the ingredients in this beer is uh, lactose, uh, you know, milk sugars. Uh, and the milk sugars are complex sugar that the yeast will not eat. So that, ye that sugar stays in the beer. So this beer ends up being sweeter. Uh, if you made another kind of stout without that, it would be a drier beer. Uh, so this is a sweet stout to start with. And then we, uh, we use some chocolate malts, uh, we use cocoa nibs in the kettle and then just a little bit of chocolate extracts in the bright tank to just give it a little bit of aroma. So there's quite a bit of chocolate flavors in this beer. I mean, you can smell it right on the nose to start with. It's not super high alcohol. It's only at, what do we call it, at 6.7%, but it's still a really nice dessert beer. This, obviously, it goes well with chocolate. Uh, goes well with ice cream. Um, just, it's it's all about the, the chocolate flavor and the and the multi flavors of this beer. Uh, we also, when we make this beer, every time we make this, we team up with Mystic Farms out in Durham. And so, anytime I make this beer, I'll go out to Mystic Farms if they have any available. I'll pick up a couple of fresh bourbon barrels. So we'll take part of this beer and put it in bourbon barrels and let it age in the bourbon barrels for a week or two. And then that becomes our Mystic Midnight. So it's a Mystic Midnight, a Mystic Distillery version of the same beer. And that'll, be, that'll kick the ABV up to like, you know, 9% with that soaking in the bourbon barrels. That makes a really nice combination. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned chocolate pairs well with the stout, but um, is there, do you have a favorite dessert that you just really love with having a milk stout? Uh, we have a really nice uh, peanut butter pie we make at our restaurants. That goes really well with this beer. Sounds delicious. Uh, yeah, good. Another question I have. So while doing some research, and don't quote me on this, everyone, but North Carolina has over 200 craft breweries. Correct. Um, besides Clouds Brewing, of course, what's one of your other favorite breweries around the state? Oh, interesting. So there's, I go to different breweries for different reasons. Sometimes I go to breweries because I just like the ambiance or good friends with the owners. Uh, uh, but for as far as like a because I like their beer. So right down the street from me is a uh, Linwood Brewing Concern. Uh, Bill makes some really good beer over there. Uh, and they've got a really nice outdoor area with their tap room. Um, trying to think of which, I don't, I've got a, a five-year-old at home. I don't get out much outside of clouds. So I'm trying to think of who else to hit up. Could also yeah. be someone from the Triangle or from Raleigh. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the people over at Lone Rider are really cool. I've, I've known the owner out there for a while. 
Uh, I'm good friends with the people that own Noose River down the street from me. So there's, it's, it's a really good community. People are really helpful to each other. When I first opened the brewery, um, I didn't have a keg washer yet. So I'd have to take my dirty kegs, put in my van, drive to a different brewery and use their, their uh, keg washers. So I'd go to Bond Brothers, use their keg line. I'd go out to uh, Lone Rider, use theirs. Uh, tried going to Noose River one time, but they had a very manual machine that <laughs> was more work than it was worth. Uh, but yeah, so people are really helpful. So it's a great community. I'm glad to hear that. And it sounds like there is a huge uh, craft beer community within the state. And based on what you describe, it seems like that you all support each other. And so that's great to hear. Yeah. And there's always collaborations going on. I see different breweries getting together for collaboration beers. I know uh, Joe at Gizmo right now is trying to get together and make that. Uh, there's a, 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 a collaboration called Black is Beautiful. They're trying to put out to help raise some funds for different social welfare issues. Uh, it's, um, and then... Um, yeah, so I've done collaborations with Gizmo in the past, with uh, Tobacco Road in the past. Awesome, glad to hear that. Um, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask, how many locations does Clouds Brewing have? Just the three you saw in the video. So we have the, the brewery here, which is uh, right behind the new Wegmans, up just inside the Beltline. And then we have the two restaurants, one downtown Raleigh, uh, which is catty corner from the uh, 42nd Street Oyster Bar. And the Durham restaurant is in a place called Brightleaf Square. Awesome. And right now, um, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but do you know how many beers you all are creating or, excuse me, producing right now on a daily basis? Oh, um, so we, because we have so many core beers, I always have to concentrate and make sure we don't run out of those. And then when we have space in the tanks for something else, we make a one-off beer. Uh, so I'm looking at my sheet right now. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got 10 different one-off beers currently available in addition to the seven core beers that we make. Awesome. And um, thanks right now. We've got, we're going to start a new uh, rotating series of IPAs called our forecast IPA. We plan to release a, a different IPA every month on that series. Um, with our sours, with the, we try to release a sour once a month and just different foods on that one. And then uh, we also have a root beer we make year-round. A really nice root beer, a non-alcoholic. Mm, that actually sounds good. I'm from Ohio, so you know, root beer kind of runs through Midwest veins. Um, I have another question. Uh, between the clouds uh, brewing lineup of beers, what's your top two? Personally? Yeah. Um, the Pilsner is my favorite, the precipitation. I always keep a keg of that one at home. It's just a really clean, uh, it's, it's a similar vein of the Vulcanbrau, but it has more hops, so it has a little bit more flavor than the Vulcanbrau, but still a really light, refreshing beer you can drink all day. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we have a one-off beer right now that we make in the fall called uh, Crimea River. It's a Baltic Porter. And so that's a really nice, it's an 8.8% .8 beer. But other than that, it's a really nice drinking beer. All right. We have a question from the crowd. I think you kind of already answered this, but we can just go back and do it one more time. When you're not drinking Clouds beer, what is your favorite beer to drink? <laughs> um, so I'm a big fan of Belgian style beers. And so, and, and they're very difficult to make. There's not a whole lot of American copies that are nearly as good as the Belgian originals. And so, Cezanne um, DuPont's one of my favorite beers. Uh, Chimay is really awesome. Uh, a lot of the different Belgian Goldens and Triples are really good. Awesome. Well, um, did we cover all, all the beers? Yep, that was all six. Awesome. Well, that kind of flew by fast. Uh, I guess, you know, when we're having so much fun, uh, time flies. Um, but I want to just thank you, uh, John, for taking the time to do this with us today. And thank you to your entire team for helping us pull this uh, tour together. We really appreciate it. Thanks for organizing it. Yeah, certainly. And then we also want to just take a moment to thank our Discover Downtown sponsors. Um, they help us do this program on a monthly basis. So um, I do want to say next week we'll be continuing tours on tap and we'll be highlighting uh, trophy brewing. Um, so we'll be sending some details out about that. Um, but in the meantime, we just encourage everyone to, you know, drink responsibly, share their tasting pack with a friend if possible, um, and then just continue to live your best life. Um, so thank you again for being here on this tour today. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week with our tour with Trophy Brewing. Cheers. Thanks, David.